Welcome. Thank you guys so much for being here today. My name is Will Hebner. I am the lead pastor here at Vincent's First Church. And we are so grateful that you managed to make it out in this yucky weather to be here because God is good no matter what weather is out there. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Man, so today is kind of one of those proud moments uh, as a pastor. And not that I had anything to do with it, but I'm, I'm just really grateful. Yesterday, Saturday, we had two different groups to two different lemonade stands, all from this church, uh, one in front of Lowe's and one here, and they raised like over $2,000 for Isaiah 117. And, and I just want to say thank you. If, if any of you, not only if you... Uh, we're part of making one happen. We're so grateful for you. But also, if you came and you went to one of the lemonade stands and you gave money and donated and, and drank some delicious lemonade and ate some delicious cookies and brownies, thank you so much. We, we greatly appreciate you. We're going to get back into the spirit of the Lord and, and just worshiping today. And I, I don't know what you face today. Sometimes when it's, it's gloomy outside, sometimes it's like, you know what, maybe God's trying to get me to stay in bed or something. I don't know. Uh, but today, regardless of what we face, we have reason to praise. Let's do that.
Holy God, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. Okay, church, we're just going to simply tell him how much we love him. Ready? You try. Try. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come on, church. I love you. Father God, we are so grateful, so thankful for every note. And Lord, we just ask that as we transition in this moment now, Lord, we just ask that you would open our hearts and minds. And and Father God, you know exactly what we need to hear today, Lord, and I don't. And so, Lord, I pray that you would silence me, that you would use me as your vessel today to to speak to every heart, including my own, uh, Lord, and, and Let it be a reminder that the true power of all we do is found in your word, in your scripture, in your truth, in your promise. Father God, it is the power in those promises that reminds us um, no matter what we face in life, no matter what we go through, Lord, that that you got us, that you have a plan and that you have a purpose. And so, Father God, as we spend this next few moments together, Lord, as we open the word of God, we just ask that you would empty me of me, that you would speak through me this morning, Father God. We pray it in your holy name. Amen. Amen. This morning we are continuing the series that we started last week called Armor of God. In this series, we've decided to look at each piece of armor that Paul mentions and how we access that armor, how we put it on, and why it matters. Ephesians 6, 11 through 17 says this. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. 
against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, let us take up the armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in an evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul, the author here, is warning us of a spiritual war that is happening around us every day. A war not fought with weapons, but whispers to our soul. A war waged for our attention and for our worship. A spiritual war that we must fight with the help and provision of God and his armor. A war in which we are encouraged to do what? To put on the belt of truth and then to put on the breastplate of righteousness. But it's important to note the order of these two because the breastplate of righteousness is preceded by the belt of truth because it would seem impossible to know what is righteous if we don't know what the truth is. Impossible to know the character of God without access to the word of God. And then Paul says, we put it on. We put on this righteousness. He's calling us to do what he's calling us to put on the character of God. And that when we wear it, when we wear the character of God, when we wear his just and upright way, it will protect us. Because that's what the breastplate did. It was a piece of armor that was responsible for protecting our vital organs. So this tells us what's written in your outline. It is righteousness that guards our hearts. It is right living that prevents the world from breaking our hearts because sin is the road that leads to death, but righteousness the path that leads to life. But the question here remains, <laughs> what is righteousness? <laughs> Webster defines righteousness as this, to act in a just and upright manner. But here's the problem, <laughs> what does that mean? What, what is a just and upright manner? How do we decipher what is right, especially when we live in a world that's constantly telling us that truth is relative? A culture that gives us what it really can't give us, and that is the permission to define truth for ourselves. In this world, how do we sift through all this mumbo-jumbo, right, and without being labeled bigots? So when I was a youth pastor in Oklahoma City, the church decided to buy a 26-passenger bus. And in order to drive a 26-passenger bus, you have to have a CDL. I'm like, I got this, no big deal. I've been driving for who knows how many years, you know. So I go in to take this test, and the 26% that I got on the test uh, <laughs> was a clue to me that I was uh, overestimating my knowledge. And most of it had to do with semi-trucks. So I got this manual, and I studied, and I learned, and I, and I got this. And then... I get to take the driver's portion of the test after I pass the written test, and guess what? They're like, we need you to do a uh, three-side inspection. You need me to do what? What does that mean? And she's like, this lady that's, that's testing me, she takes me to the side of the bus. She's like, tell me what you see. Well, I see a logo and some, some wheels. And I'm not, I'm not kidding you, this happened to me. I reached down to check a lug nut. And it's like, listen, you gotta make sure these things are on tight. And I touched it and it fell off. <laughs> now, I didn't realize what had happened at the time. It was just the cap for the lug nut. But I'm like, I'm like picking it up, sticking it in my pocket. Looks good to me. <laughs> but then to my horror, she takes me over to uh, the front of the bus and she says, okay, let's, let's pop the hood. So we popped the hood, and she's like, okay, tell me what you see. I see some hoses, and I see some wires, and hey, I'm pretty sure that big thing's the engine. That's about all I got. So I don't know if you've guessed it so far. I did not pass the inspection uh, the first time, nor the second time, nor the third time, but fourth time's a charm. I did, I did, I did finally pass it, and, and it's great. But... Uh, 
This lady, and I get how stupid this sounds, but this lady is asking me about the compartment of this vehicle that holds all the things that make it work. And let me just be honest, I didn't have a clue. And truthfully, if you wanted to know about this, who's the person you should ask? You should probably ask the person that assembled it, right? The person that built this engine, the person that built this car, they're going to be the ones that actually know what this hose runs to and what this hose does and how this works and how this functions and if it's breaking, how to fix it, right? So follow me here. If we believe that God created this world, then he's privy to something that we aren't. How it works. For me, the only logical way to define what is right and wrong, to define righteousness, is to measure everything against God's character. This means that God is the only one who holds the knowledge of what is good and evil. Because he's responsible for creating the world, he's also responsible for knowing what is true and what is righteous. This means that God has to be the foundation, right? We got, we got to let go of everything we think is right and yield to an all-knowing God of love. Not to use the truth of God to handcuff those that the truth was meant to set free and not to use the truth to beat ourselves up, but rather that we too might be free. Because righteousness is meant to protect us, not to add shame. So the question is, how, how does it do that? How does righteousness protect us? And that's where we're going to be this morning. You can follow along if you want to fill in the blanks on your notes. This is the, this is the first piece. The law cannot save, but it can protect. The law cannot save you, but it can protect you. See, the Bible is clear. We have no hope in this world outside of Jesus. We are a people who are 100% saved by grace and faith. But our inability to save ourselves does not nullify the power of obedience. You know, a lot of times I'm obedient, but I'm obedient for selfish reasons. I follow the path that God lays, and then I, I expect to be rewarded for it. Like my, my ability to follow the rules, I, I puff up my chest and... And I'm like, okay, look at me, God. I deserve this because I'm a good person. But listen, obedience is an honorable thing, but the heart behind obedience is even more honorable. There's a big difference in being obedience that's, that's motivated by self-preservation versus obedience that's based out of love and respect and trust and faith. I want to read to you Romans 5, 20 through 6, 4. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. So right here we're given the truth of why the law was given so we could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, then God's wonderful grace became more abundant. And then he says, well, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death as well? We're buried with him in that baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised, that we too might be raised from the dead, that we too might walk in newness of life. So here we see that the law was given not, not to save us, but to reveal the fact that we needed to be saved. But we also see that, that grace is all-encompassing regardless of what our sin is. But that doesn't mean that grace is a license to sin or to do whatever we want without consequence. So just because the law can't save us doesn't mean that we just discard it. Instead, grace is God's way of doing inside of us what we cannot do on our own. It's his way to become strength in our weakness so that grace has two purposes. Grace is not just to cover our sin, but it also catalyzes transformation. But the law is in place to be the guiding principles for that transformation. Placed there as a shield to, to shield us from the effects of the outcome of sin, which is death. 
So many of you guys know that I, I had an opportunity to, to travel to India on a missions trip. And one of the times we went, we, we traveled into another country called Bangladesh. And, and while we're in Bangladesh, travel's pretty limited. And so we're, we're on our way to, to catch a bus that's going to take us up uh, into some area of Bangladesh called Lal Mahat. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. So we're on our way there. We pull up to this Mercedes charter bus, and I'm like, okay, we're traveling in style today, only to get on the bus to go, okay, overestimated the, the logo on this thing. It was not as nice as I suspected. And so I'm, I'm sitting in the front seat. This bus is packed, and it's a long trip. It's like a three-, four-hour trip, so I decide to take a nap. Our bus comes to a stop, and I wake up, and mind you, I'm in a charter bus, and I'm in the front row seat, so the window's right there. I wake up, and there's an elephant in my face. And I'm like, what is going on? And I look over to the driver, and the elephant sticks his trunk into the driver's window. The driver hands him some money, and then the elephant gets out of the way, and then we keep going. And, and I, look, I look at our, our, our ministry pastor that's with us, and I said, what just happened? He said, we just paid an elephant toll. <laughs> what? So this dude just owns an elephant, and he goes on the road, and he just sits there. And until you give him some money, you ain't going nowhere. Garrett, I got a great idea for a youth fundraiser. but it's going to require us to drive to Indianapolis and steal an elephant from the zoo. <laughs> and you're riding it, not me. Right? This is outrageous. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a foreign country, but the one thing that I learned through all of this experience is it gave me an appreciation for the traffic laws that we have here in America. Now, I get that everybody in this room, we may not agree on the traffic laws, but we can agree at least that someone has put these in place. Why? Not, not because they, they wanted to make sure we don't have any fun on the road. They, they put these traffic laws in place so that we can drive safely, making sure that we don't get robbed by elephants, right? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We live in a very dark world and Jesus is the light. That's why scripture says that his word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Living in a world that we live in, it's, it's like living in a minefield and we have a God who has given us a map and says, listen, I don't know that I would step there. It's dangerous. So even though the law cannot necessarily save us, even though the law can't, can't help us earn favor with God, it's still useful. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this acronym of the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Like th this idea that th this is in place to prevent us from harm, and that if we listen and trust God and, and enough to be obedient to his word, then guess what? Like armor, his word will protect us from the shrapnel and chaos of living in a sin-saturated world. The next piece is this. Our decisions determine our disposition. Our decisions determine our disposition. And what I'm saying is, is that our decisions over time tend to mold our inclinations and our tendencies. The idea that the people that we spend time with and the content that we listen and watch molds us. This idea that the choices that we make matter. Little ones, big ones, they all matter because they often determine the construction of our character. So... Can we be effective followers of Jesus if we don't follow Jesus? The answer to that is no, right? If we're choosing every day to be influenced by the world rather than to be influenced by our Savior 
Jesus Christ, to be our main guide, right? There's a story in Scripture in 1 Samuel 5. The uh, people of Israel, who are God's people, they have this ark called the Ark of the Covenant. It is literal the, the resting place of God. And they used to take the ark to war with them because if they took the ark with them, then they would never lose war because God was with them. Except this time, God wasn't with them because the people had been disobedient. So they take the ark of the covenant into war and they lose the war and their enemy, the Philistines, take the ark and they take it to their temple as a trophy and they set it next to their god, Dagon only to go to sleep that night to wake up to come into the temple and their statue, their statue of a God named Dagon is bowing before the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> That's embarrassing, right? So then these people are like, okay, there must have been like an earthquake or something, right? So they set the statue up. They go to sleep that night. Then they wake up again and guess what? He's again, he's lying prone on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant and his head's fallen off this time. And this crazy thing happens. This, this, this is what the people of the, the Philistines, this is what they say. This is 1 Samuel 5, 7. When the people realized what was happening, they cried out, we cannot keep the Ark of God of Israel here any longer because he is against us and we will be destroyed and our God Dagon will be destroyed. Man, when I first read this, I, I was amazed at how daft these people seem. Like, like, why would you stay with a God who is clearly weaker? You experience this incredible power, this, this mighty hand of Jehovah, and your response is to kick him out. Get out of here. We don't, we don't want you. Was there, was there not anybody in that nation who took the chance to, to sit there and think, hey, you know what? Maybe we're serving the wrong God here. And then I felt the subtle whisper of God say, are you really that different? How many times have you seen and experienced God in your life, his mighty hand in your life, but then woke up the next day and you looked to heaven and you said, you know what? I got it today, God. I'm good. I don't need you today. How often have I chosen to neglect my spiritual disciplines for what I think is best? You see, every day, each and every single one of us, we make thousands of decisions, and some of those decisions are thought out, and some of them are just out of habit. For instance, like, I don't usually wake up and think, mm, I smell bad, I need to shower. I, it's just, it's natural now. I don't even think about it. I just wake up and I get into the shower. It just becomes natural. The, the question I want to ask us today is, what, what are your influences? Who are you allowing to influence you? And the reason this is so dangerous is because sometimes when we spend too much time letting the wrong things influence, we, we start to live like that. Where we're not even thinking about what influences us. We're just living a certain way and how dangerous that is. How are your influences affecting your disposition? And are they drawing you closer to God or pushing you further away from God? Are we giving God enough influence in our lives to influence us for his good. So I made a lot of uh, poor choices uh, as a youth pastor. And technically, at this time, I was just an intern, so I guess I give myself a little bit of grace. But we went on this trip to Roach, Missouri, and we went into this cave. We're, we're doing this cave diving experience. And I'm just saying, if, if you are as big or bigger than me, Cave diving is not for you. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's especially if you're claustrophobic. But, you know, the kids are going and they're like, you're, you know, you're a scaredy cat if you don't go. So, of course, you know, you got to go. I <laughs> can't, let, can't let the kids call me out like that. You know, we go through this experience. It, it ends up being quite a bit of fun. And, and I don't know, like, around the time that we went, Bear Grylls was, like, huge. And we get down, and one of my students that I was really close with, we're, we, we find this, like, underground creek. And I looked at him, and I was like, yo, I bet Bear Grylls would drink this water right now. And so we both drank the water. Well, not a great decision. So about a couple months later, me and this kid, his name's Tucker, we went to go see a movie, and... 
maybe like five minutes into the movie, he goes to the bathroom, and then the movie ends, and I look over. He's been gone this whole time. Where, where, did, where did he go? He's, he's been in the bathroom the whole time, and he's having major, major stomach issues, all to find out. He goes to the doctor, and guess what? He's got a parasite. And the doctor asks, have you drank in any weird water lately? Uh, yeah, I drank some water in a cave with my youth pastor. Like, so all, all, of, all, of, this, all, of, this, all of this trouble that he goes through, gets, gets a parasite all over an idiotic decision to drink cave water influenced by me. And there are many times in my life where I wished a student had listened to me, and this is not one of them. We've got to be really careful what we're allowing to influence us. This is why Solomon writes in Proverbs 4.23, Guard your hearts above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What he's telling us is that we ought to guard our hearts from the people and things that will be bad for us and ultimately push us away from Jesus. And you think, well, that's great, Pastor, but, but how? How do we do that? I want to read to you Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do all things without complaining or arguments so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless, innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding firmly to the word of life. Here Paul introduces to us something that is really revolutionary, this idea, the way of living above reproach, which means to not even be associated with evil like this idea that the, the law of God draws this line in the sand between right and wrong and reproach is the wisdom to not even go near the line, which tells us that reproach is built upon making decisions that is influenced by the word of God and that that evidence is shown in us by the way in which we choose to live. And, and Luke tells us that. This is Luke 4, 45. A person full of goodness in his heart produces what? Produces good things. A person with an evil reservoir in his heart pours out evil things. The heart overflows and the words that a person speaks, your words reveal what is in your heart. So the question I ask us today is, is what does a heart influenced by God sound and look like? Because ultimately that's the question we ask, right? And, and, and we could go really, really deep with this because I, I think there's a lot to it. But, but I think at, at the heart of it, it's relatively simple, and that is love. So the next question that I want to ask you today is, are your words, are your actions of your heart speaking love? Because if there's not love in your heart, then there's not love coming out of you. And this whole idea is that when we seek the righteousness of God, his love is inside of us, and then we love others through that love. The question is, is our disposition one of love? Sometimes we've got to sit down and we've got to ask ourselves some tough questions. Am I loving God well? Am I loving the people around me well? Am I loving myself well? Are our choices starting to reflect the character of God? And if not, maybe it's time to consider, maybe it's time to, con to, to take a closer look at what it is that we're allowing to influence us and replace it with the decision to spend more time with jo Jesus, to spend more time with God, to let him influence us which leads us to the last piece of this. And that is that today's righteousness defends us from yesterday's failure. Today's righteousness defends us from yesterday's failure. The reality that, that who you were yesterday doesn't have to define who you are today. That every new day is an opportunity for repentance and change. 
When we hear that word breastplate, I don't know about you, but I automatically think of the chest and the stomach. But the Roman breastplate in which Paul is referring to also protected your back. We have a picture of, of Roman armor. It wasn't just protection in the front, but it also protected your back. Protection from everything that's behind you, all the past, all the sin, all the mistakes, all the failure, all the mess-ups. See, the enemy would love to convince you that you didn't make mistakes, but that you are the mistake, that you are the failure, that you are the mess-up, that you're not capable of choosing righteousness, that you're too far gone. But to believe that lie is to deny the truth of Jesus' work on the cross. Because he came to show the way of righteousness. He came to pardon you so that sin could be dealt with and that you could step into newness of life. So here we see the truth in the scripture that no matter how long, no matter how far you've gone in the wrong direction, if you are alive and breathing, it's never too late to make a U-turn. It's never too late to start heading in the right direction at the end of August, uh, we're going to pack up into our uh, minivan and we're going to head to go see my mama. Why? Because it's mama. You know, I love mama. I'm a mama's boy. You know, going to see mama, it's true vacation because she cooks and woo, can that woman cook, man. That's all I'm saying. But when we make that journey, when we start that trip, it doesn't just happen like that, right? It happens one mile at a time. And every mile that we get closer to Georgia is a mile that we get further from home. Some of you, you, you have to realize this, that, that, that every step in the right direction is a step further from the wrong. This means that every decision that we make to pursue righteousness pulls us away from our past failure. And the further you get from your past, the easier it is to step into a new future where we live for righteousness. But what does that look like in real life? What does it look like to pursue righteousness? And I think for us, for all of us, it starts with repentance. It starts with repenting. And repenting is, is so much more than a confession. Repentance literally means to turn around and go the other direction. A realization that your life is heading in the wrong direction and you wake up and say, nope, <laughs> not today. That's not who I am. That's not who I'm meant to be. To refocus and to set our eyes on the goal of righteousness and to pursue that with God's help. That's where it starts and that's where it ends. It ends with more repentance. Matthew 3, 8 says this, bear fruit and keeping with repentance. This idea of keeping up with repentance, this idea that repentance is, is who we become, right? I love this verse because it gives us that idea that repentance is supposed to be perpetual. Like those of us who have repented, sometimes we take step back. Sometimes we fall back into bad habits. But this means that we break habits by learning to persist in our repentance. To, to form habits of, of letting our sin and temptation remind us to turn back from God. Instead of feeling shameful about the mistakes we make, we walk into those mistakes and say, oh my goodness, let me turn back to God. And just imagine that for a moment. Think about an enemy who's tempting you because he wants you to be far from God. What does it do to his psyche if we use every time he screws up our life, we use that as an excuse to seek Jesus Christ? It helps him to think twice about what he's doing. I can tell you that. There's a, there's a story in Bible that I, I think most of us are familiar with. It's okay if you're not. There's a guy in the Bible, his name is King David, and, and he was the second king of Israel. And it was said of him that he had a heart after God. But it wasn't said of him that he had a heart after God because he was a good dude. He made plenty. You, you go read First and Second Samuel, you'll see he made plenty of mistakes. Maybe none more chiefly than to commit adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. 
And not only does he commit adultery, he gets her pregnant, and then to cover it up, he kills her husband on the battlefield, and to make it worse, her husband is one of his mighty men. <laughs> this is getting nasty quick. And wrapped up in all that sin, what happens? The prophet Nathan comes to him and says, listen, David, you've, you've been making some bad choices, dude. And this is David's response. I want to read to you Psalm 51. This is verses 8 through 12. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy, the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. I love David's perspective here, because even though a broken bone is really painful, what David is saying is that it hurts so good. He rejoices because of the lesson that he learned. He rejoices because it reminded him to repent. It reminded him that he had lost his way and that he needed to seek God. We as Christians are not defined by whether or not we lose our way. We're defined by what we do when we do lose our way. Are we a people that continue to seek after the face of Jesus Christ? Not just to take advantage of his grace, but that we too might step into that righteousness, that we might learn from our folly, and that it would protect us in the future. You say, well, man, how do, how do we repent? What, what does that look like? So when I was in college, there was something going wrong with my car. And I didn't know what it was, and so I took it to Firestone, and those guys were like, listen, you need to change your upper and lower ball joints and your tie rod arms. All, all of it needs to be replaced. And they quoted me like, I don't know, like three grand, something like that. And I was like, man, I, I'm in college. I've got three grand to be spending on a car. And so I talked to some of my buddies, and a couple of them knew, knew how to fix stuff worked on cars a lot, and they're like, man, you can go buy the parts for $600 and we'll help you do it. So that's what we did. I went and I bought the parts and I fixed it up. But here, here's the, the problem. I still ended up having to take it in afterwards. Why? Because I had to get it realigned. I, I couldn't do that. I didn't have the machinery to get it realigned. You know, I could fix some things here or there, but ultimately after I had fixed it, I had to take it in so that it could be re a line. That's what repentance is. For us that are believers, it's, it's making sure that our lives stay realigned. Like we work on our lives here and there, but, but God's the only one that can really align our hearts to His. So the question really is, how do we do that? How do, how do we align our hearts with God, with His? Realizing that, that the closer our hearts are to Him, the higher our level of protection from the world will be. And to me, this, this answer comes full circle, right? Because how do we align our hearts? We, we pursue righteousness. And we know righteousness by discovering the truth in God's Word through the belt of truth. And we repent by giving up our own way to follow His way, to model our life after Jesus and to love others like He loved us. And I think for a lot of us, it's, it's not necessary uh, like a lack of desire. Like we, we want this. And sometimes it just doesn't happen in our lives. Like it's, it's not a desire problem. It's a lack of follow through. And this is what we commonly know as the action behavioral gap. This is where we just have a hard time implementing the change that we desire, the change that we want. And, and I just have two pieces of advice to end on today. One, quit trying to do it on your own. That's, a lot of times we can't make the change because it's not in us to do it on ourselves. We got to rely on God and we got to rely on the people around us, the people that will look at us and say, how are you doing? How's it been like for you this week? What can I do to help you? Where have you struggled? To do this, man, you have to ask. You have to ask God for permission to come in. Like, tell him. 
And sometimes you have to pray and ask God to send people into your life. But then at the same time, you still have to ask people, because let me tell us, I'm going to be real honest with you, and this is coming from me as a pastor, we cannot help you if you do not let us know what's wrong. Some people get so mad, nobody helps me. Well, who knows what's going on with you? Have you asked for help? What does Scripture tell us? You have not because you what? Because you ask not. It's not that there aren't people in this church that, that won't help you. And, and maybe you're afraid because you're like, well, I don't want people to judge me for what I struggle with. And find, pray, pray God would send you the right person because the right person is not going to judge you because the right person understands that their own sin was enough to nail Jesus to the cross. And they're going to love you through it. The, the second piece of this is that we, we have to quit focusing on what not to do. Instead, focus on the good that we're supposed to to do. Sometimes we get so focused on, man, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do this. No, no, no. Change the way you think. Focus instead on, man, how can I love that person? How can I be kind to that person? How can I exhibit self-control here? How can I do those good things? Because it, righteousness doesn't mean to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we're always put together. It doesn't mean that we're free from trauma and stress and drama. Instead, it's a life that's focused on love. Because at the end of the day, what could be more righteous than love? What could be more effective than love? So all I'm saying here is what if we quit focusing on the negative and instead say, you know what, when I'm at work, when I'm at school, when I'm at home, how can I be love? How can I show kindness? to my family, to my coworkers, to my bosses, to my employees. How might they see the righteousness in me? Because guess what? Those of us that are, that are believers, we're going to have that breastplate of righteousness on. But now we got to think about how do we share that with somebody else? So we're just supposed to take that protection for ourselves? No, God, God wants us to share that. He wants us to live right not because he wants the world to know that they're wrong, not to shame them, but to say, hey, there's just a better way. And, and I want to guide you through the minefield that is life without you getting your legs blown off. That's all God wants for you. So today we have an opportunity. I don't know where you are and I don't know how you need to respond today. I know how I need to respond because <laughs> I got my own garbage that I need to take to the altar. But don't miss out on opportunity today.
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. Just you, church, you try it. Even when, come on, just you. Father God, thank you so much for this place. And Lord, sometimes it's hard to know what to pray. Sometimes, God, it's just nice to sit in your presence and to be quiet. Lord, I don't, I don't pretend to know everything that we'll face this week. And for some of us, it'll be joyful. For some, it'll be hard. I'm thankful that we don't go it alone. And I'm thankful that you've given us a way for protection. Because sometimes this world throws everything it has at us. Father God, you've given us your armor, your truth, your righteousness, your peace to guard our hearts, to guard our minds. So Lord, we just ask that you would go with us from this place. And, and, and I pray, Lord, I, I always pray that we not just be a people that are blessed, that we not just be a people that pray and ask for all this just so we can be blessed, but Lord, to me, that the heart of all of it is so that we can go and be a blessing. So that by our righteousness and that by our truth and that by our peace, we might rub off on the world around us. That when the world is chaos and we stand on the firm foundation of your word, that people start to take notice. So Lord, give us strength. Give us purpose. We love you. We praise you. Thank you so much for all that you are and all that you do, Lord. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, we, we just have a, a few announcements for you before we let you go. Uh, tonight, the youth kids are going to do something pretty exciting. It's called a Destination Unknown. But just so that you're not worried, Garrett does know where he's going, okay? Uh, but the kids don't know. But if you're a parent like me who gets a little nervous about not knowing what's going on, listen, give him a call. He'll let you know what's going on. Uh, it's going to be exciting. They're going to meet here at church at 5 p.m., and all they need is 10 American dollars, okay? And they're going to have tons of fun. They should be back around 8.30. I also want to let you know that he is uh, getting a trip together for Holiday World and taking the kiddos there on the 27th of this month. If you're interested in that, Please, there's a sign-up sheet out there. You can come talk to Garrett about it. And I just want to say this. 
Uh, if there's any of you that know somebody that might be interested that's youth age and you think for a second that they're not going to go because money is an issue, you send them to us. We'll take care of it. It's no big deal. We have scholarship stuff available. We have very generous people in this church who have already offered uh, to help make some of that happen. So we'd love for your kiddos to go and bring their friends as well. You can sign up or out there, or you can, you can get information to Garrett, talk to him about it. Uh, also, on the 20th of this month, we're going to do something for the first time. Uh, we're just going to have a worship night, and there's really no agenda on this night other than to come and to sing and to get in the presence of God. We are going to have child care. It's going to be from 6.30 to 7.30. It's just an hour of being in the presence of the Lord. I promise I'm not going to preach, so if you're worried about falling asleep, don't worry. You know, you come. Uh, none of that. There is no agenda on the night other than getting in the presence of the Lord. And, and also today we are going to have a uh, lunch for anybody that's interested in being a part of our welcome team. Now, in the past, we've uh, split this up between ushers and greeters, and technically, ushers and greeters are still going to exist, but they're all going to be formed under this umbrella that is the welcome team. So when you come in and you're greeted with a door being open or a smile on somebody's face or, or somebody hands you a bulletin, that's that first experience of walking in the doors that re we, we really, it means a lot somebody's first experience. And, and so we, we want to make sure that we do that well. So we're going to appreciate those that have been doing it. And if you're interested in uh, potentially being a part of that team, wanting to stand out there, if you're like, hey, I can hold the door for somebody, or hey, I can smile and, and say hi to somebody, or, or hey, I can hand somebody a bulletin. This might be something that you're interested in. We'd love for you to come. Stay. But if you can't stay today, just call in the office, man. We'd love to get you involved with the welcome team. That's all we have today. Thank you so much for being here. You are just go with God.